Designed for ground support, the A-10 Warthog is simple and rugged. But in the Persian Gulf, commanders send Warthog pilots against the most lethal threats in modern war. I don't know if scared's the right word, but uh, certainly living in a state of, uh, of higher awareness, if you will. January 19th, 1991. Two days after the air assault against Iraq is launched, Saddam Hussein rains down Scud missiles on Tel Aviv. It is part of an effort by the dictator to incite Israel into entering the war. Panic is widespread. Many fear that the Iraqi Scuds will carry biological or chemical warheads. The prospect of poison gas being used against a nation born of the Holocaust is too much to bear. But if the Israelis enter the conflict, the Arab states united against Iraq will pull out of the war, and the threadbare U.S.-led coalition will fall apart. The entire Scud crisis was something that drove politicians crazy. It drove planners crazy. The missile is not a greatly accurate missile. Uh, it's kind of like a V-2 from World War II that the Germans built. Not much different than that, really. But the uh, potential terror capability of this weapon demanded we go get them. But unfortunately, there were many, many uh, cardboard tubes out there painted that looked like scuds. Well, are you going to send a $60 million airplane against something that might be really just uh, nothing but the garbage? That was the problem. Instead, the Air Force sends the $1.5 million Fairchild Republic A-10. Called the Warthog, this mean, ugly plane has long been the brunt of jokes throughout the service. With a top speed of 375 knots, the Hog is very slow. Supersonic fighter jocks like to say that the A-10's airspeed indicator is a calendar and that the aircraft takes bird strikes in the rear. But compared to modern fighter jets, it is an incredibly rugged machine. Just one thirtieth the cost of an F-16, the Warthog can absorb fire that would bring down a squadron of Falcons. When pilots climb into the cockpit, they are surrounded by a titanium bathtub that in early tests withstood direct hits from 57 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. The hog's twin tail serves to mask the infrared signature of the engines and provides great low speed control. It is the consummate close air support weapon. The hog's two GE TF-34 engines are mounted above the wing so that when taxiing on primitive runways, they do not suck up rocks or dirt. External to the fuselage, they are built so that if one is hit, it can burn, fall off, and the hog will still fly. The aircraft is built around a vicious 30 millimeter cannon that fires depleted uranium rounds able to penetrate enemy armor from up to two miles away. Hog pilots are trained to cater to the needs of ground troops. They are the closest thing the Air Force has to GIs in a cockpit. And in recent years, Army leaders have made clear their desire to command the Warthog as their own. Fascinated by high-tech fly-by-wire technology, the Warthog has always been the bastard child. In fact, 
When General Horner's own son chooses to fly hogs, his father claims that the boy has died of brain damage. Just months prior to Desert Storm, the A-10 was headed for the chopping block in the Arizona desert. Matter of fact, uh, it had to be shoved down the Air Force's throat to some degree. When the A-10 was proposed, the Air Force really didn't want it because it wasn't a gimmick box that you could stuff all these goodies into. The Air Force likes the high-tech option, and they like complex gear. The A-10 is certainly not complex. It's a simple, straight, easy to fly, rugged airplane. Despite their questionable status, when the crisis in the Gulf breaks out, hogs are some of the first U.S. warplanes ready and able to head to Saudi Arabia. Squadrons of A-10s are rushed from Europe and America to the kingdom's northern desert strips. If Iraqi troops push on from Kuwait towards the Saudi oil fields, the hogs will be sacrificed until additional forces can be rushed to the theater. As we parked, I remember popping my canopy, and I immediately got hit with a blast of hot air. So I start looking around, trying to figure out whose jet wash, you know, who had their airplane uh, parked and was blowing their uh, exhaust over my cockpit. And uh, I couldn't find anybody. That was just the, uh, the wind and the heat. Wow. You may be wondering what this compound is here, and it just happens to be uh, our temporary home until we can get a really nice tent. As summer gives way to fall, it becomes apparent that the Iraqis are content with defending occupied Kuwait. For the next six months, nearly 200 Warthog pilots will make a home in the Saudi desert. One of these men, Major Scott Hill of the 353rd Fighter Squadron, will create a video diary of their experiences there. I hope they're real toilets. They're not, they're the holes in the floor. Oh no, there's a real one. Initially, no beds or furniture or anything like that associated with it, but as time went on, and not too much time, we ended up with bunk beds in there, and everybody went to the task of building their own furniture out of building materials they could find laying around. Now, are these shells or are those shells? Those are shells. Check it out. Homemade shells. This is just like a mash. I love it. Hey, man, this is, this is great. great. Here's Spud, man. You see the beach outside? We have a, we have a beach Look. here, right there. Yeah, a wall. This is a live special report from AP Network News. Crisis in the Gulf. The deadline passes. We view this situation with the utmost gravity. Uh, we remain committed to take whatever steps are necessary to defend our long-standing vital interests uh, in the Gulf. Nearly half a year after the 353rd's arrival, the deadline set for Iraqi troops to leave Kuwait finally comes to pass. The Americans stationed in the Gulf now realize that war is inevitable. Early on, they are told that unlike Vietnam, there will be no rotation home. They are in for the duration. Some spend the final hours taking one last look at video messages from their families. Most of us stayed up the night before the war and either wrote a letter home and I wrote one that I sent home, uh, one to my parents and one to my family and, and then I also wrote another one that I kept in my, uh, in my footlocker there in, in case I didn't come back from a mission and it was just more or less instructions as to you know how I wanted things to happen if I wasn't going to come home from the desert. Yes. Really foul. Liberation of Kuwait has begun. <laughs> On January 17th, the air assault is launched. Everybody and their brother was coming to this one area because they were heard that there was armor out the ass, and there was. And the initial strike 